Well, hello, folks. You know you're in for a treat when you've heard that sound because it means it's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast uh, Forums Edition Audio Q Spectacular. Uh, I'm your host, Jim Reed, um, rec.poker slash crew to find out more about me and the wizards here behind the panel. Also, I got to shout out uh, Mark Prashan at Website Amp and our great friends at Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino. Now, if you've never heard of Rec Poker and you're just tuning in for the first time, we're a community of amateur recreational poker players who like to learn together, hang out together, study together, play together, rail each other, and uh, just express our love for poker with the rest of the poker world. Um, it's free to come join us at rec.poker. All it takes is an email address and a smile. And I can tell already you've got both of those. So come on over and join us. Uh, post in the forums like these folks have done. And uh, you can get some feedback and some advice on your game. And uh, if we like your question or your hand, maybe we'll pull it here on the air. Um, we're actually talking to a few members of the Wrecking Crew here today who have done the same. Uh, gang, why don't you introduce yourself to the group here? I'm Eric Jen, known as Binkley on the forums. And you can find me on Twitter at Rec Binkley. And I'm John Somsky. I'm Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm pet vet most places, Fergie 56 in our Poker Stars games. And it's the Monday night. Here we are. We're recording this uh, during the home game. So if you're playing along at home on Monday night, uh, you can know that Jim and John and Kim and Eric and whoever else is recording might be a little distracted. So it's a good chance to come steal their blinds, get them in a sizing error, post flop, something like that. Come steal the chips on Monday night. We play every night. Um, another thing we do every week uh, is we take a post from the rec.poker forums, like I say, and we talk about it here on the show. So tonight we're actually looking at a post from Binkley himself, the one and only Eric Jen. Uh, this is uh, a six mask, a six max cash hand. I know we talk about tournaments a lot, but uh, I'm a cash player originally, so this one's near and dear to my heart. And uh, Eric, you said you put out a Twitter poll about this hand and some of the responses uh, surprised you a little. So why don't you take us through uh, the action and what made it an interesting hand? Yeah, so this happened on Ignition. So if anybody's familiar with Ignition, it's a, an American facing site and it can get wild in the <laughs> cash streets. Um, it says 100 NL. Um, so I'm in the small blind. I have a uh, 100 big blinds and uh, low jack folds, the high jack limps, cut off folds, and the button calls. And so I'm in the small blind with pocket nines. And so the decisions to me. Um, uh, in game, uh, to me, it was just a matter of sizing of how much I'm going to raise. Um, I don't really like flatting here because it'll just invite the big blind in. Uh, I have a pretty strong hand, so I prefer uh, raising. So in my Twitter poll, I um, posed this question of, of basically how, how much would you raise for? Um, I like exploitably uh, raising larger against uh, the particular limpers I find in ignition because they are tend to be calling station, tend to be uh, weaker players that I would like to play a big pot with. Um, so I, I give different options in my Twitter poll, you know, would you go with 4x, 5x, 8x, and I or you know, or some other sizing? Just you know, say in the comments. Um, but to I didn't even put limping as a, as an option. But to my surprise, um, I had some responses of of some players that whose game I I respect that said, "Oh yeah, just limp behind." So that that surprised me. Um, thinking about it, um, I think maybe they were thinking more of a tournament situation as opposed to a cash situation where, you know, in cash, you get stacked, you just rebuy in and you go back to playing. Um, so uh, based on that response, and uh, I decided to post in the forum and kind of get, get the community's uh, feedback on this. Yeah, well, it's a really interesting spot. And I, I think the, you know, we, we find a lot of these like cusp hands where, there's things that make them good for multiple 
uh, situations. And so we kind of have to decide like, what are the trade-offs we're going to make here? Um, and this is one where I think the strength of the hand, it's just sort of demands that we raise it pre-flop. Uh, but the characteristics of the hand are such that we don't want to play a bloated uh, pot out of position with it. It's a hand that it's only got two out, so it's hard to improve. Um, and you can't really, you don't get a lot of draws with it, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a hot or cold kind of hand post-flop. And it's the kind of hand where if you do get a set, you, you can then put a lot of money in good. So people like to play it in a low SPR situation. Um, so this is a good tension because I feel like a lot of times we're faced with these decisions where we've got the strength of the hand versus like these other sort of characteristics of the hand. And it's hard to balance those factors along with other factors like stack size and position and that sort of thing. Um, John, I saw you on mute. Did you have something to add there? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, in general, so pocket nines, if you choose to call, you're basically deciding to play it more or less to hit do set mining and to hit a set. Um, but the problem with that is with you just have limpers, you're not guaranteed to be paid off very well. I would rather call someone who had raised pre because then if a flop like ace nine comes, you could potentially win a very large pot and stack them. Um, in this particular case, I think I prefer to go ahead and raise. Uh, that way you have the capability of representing the high cards when they come. Um, two thirds of the time, they aren't going to hit anything on the flop. So you'll be able to steal it a bunch or nines might even be good some of the time. And at this point in time, even if you take it down pre-flop, that's not a bad outcome. So um, I think I definitely prefer the raise. Uh, if possible, it'd be nice to get in against one caller. Hmm. Um, now that may be, there may be no such bet size that will give that. <laughs> it could be that you will either get no callers or you will get two callers, but. Yeah, I agree. I think I'd like to see a big raise size from, especially since you're out of position for this. And I'm assuming you're going to call off versus the hijack with who only has 29 big blinds. Yes. So that, that's another right. thing that, that I put in my post, but it didn't mention here is the, the relative stack sizes. Uh, the original limper only has 30 big blinds and uh, the big blind has 25 big blinds. So um, in cash, that's often an indication of a weaker player, right? Somebody who hasn't topped off to 100 big blinds. And the button who overlimped um, has about 100 big blinds. So I thought I was incentivized to try to get the sh potentially stronger player, the button, out of there. So that's another reason that I felt um, a raise has benefits because I want to force out the the potentially good player and keep the weaker players to myself. Right. So if you, if that happens and you rate and you raise large, you're pretty much going to have less than two to one stacked pot ratio. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Say you raise to seven or eight big lines. Um, uh, yeah. I believe I, I ended up raising to eight. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's the spot where I think some people are thinking about how they're going to play their range, which I think includes pocket nines in, in a raising range here. And then some people that are thinking, how am I going to play this hand in front of me right now? Um, and there's nothing wrong with either one of those. But um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about how the range of hands that you play is really where you derive your profit from. Um, individual hands that you play, they're really just sort of like instances. And it, it's its one of the great tensions of poker is when to sort of like play in a way that expresses your range and when to play in a, ra in a way that really just suits your hand instead. Um, does it, do, do, does, 
what are what are the characteristics of a hand? And there's some great responses here in the in the forum itself. What are the kind of hands that we would want to be continuing with as a call here? And what makes them different from this hand? Like Chris Jones talks about uh, continuing with smaller pocket pairs, for instance. Yeah, I mean, so maybe deuces, threes, fours, fives, maybe sixes. Um, I I would just have flatted because there I'm, I am purely set mining. And um, I love Chris's comment. He said, well, when you, if you decide to flat with nines, you've basically turned nines into deuces. Right. I, I, love, I love that comment by him. Yeah. And I think he's kind of saying that, that nines have value in them uh, beyond set mining, that you are kind of yielding by just calling here. And by using them as a, as a hand that can only win by set mining, you're leaving money on the table in EV terms in the long, in the long, in the long run. Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, I think that's, I think that's what, what he would say. Uh, we also get a great comment here from I'm a Luigi. Uh, this is a clear raise, especially in a cash game. I'm sizing seven or eight big blinds. We're out of position. We want to narrow the field. If we limp, we're almost exclusively set mining as there are a few flops where we're comfortable even with an overpair to two low cards. I agree we need a large size, uh, larger than standard because of three opponents, our specific hand and being out of position. We're trying to isolate against one opponent. Um, and he says, there are some turning spots where I don't mind completing here against uh, an effective stack, but you are going to see a situation like this very, very rarely in attorney. So there's some great points there by uh, I'm a Luigi. So then uh, sounds like we're all on the same page sizing wise then in that case. Now, are we going to, I think we agree that the worst thing to do would be to raise to a very small sizing here, like three or four big blinds or something like that. Is that actually worse than calling or do we think calling is still worse i think small raise is worse because we're, we're out of position for the entire hand yep and we're just inviting everybody to come in giving them great odds to come in with it whatever two cards they're holding yeah right maybe and we might get the big blind to fold but that's probably the only one yeah we we want the the stack that covers us the button to go away and we're and we small size it the Big blind is oh, he's going to call, and then it's that domino effect, right? Mm. Right. The big blind calls, and then the hijack will call, and the button's like, "Well, pff, uh, I'll call." Right. And and he's the, he's the it's the stack that threatens our entire stack. Um, pocket nines for thirty big blinds, yeah, I'll, I'll stack off. <laughs> right. At a hundred big blinds, you know, that's that's. A different proposition that you know i want to there is where i want to hit us at yeah i agree and uh well why don't we hear from our friend jonathan little and then we'll come back and talk about some of the knock-on effects that are good and bad um from raising and from calling here instead have you ever wondered whether you should call a preflop raise or three bet instead what do you do when you have a flush draw do you raise it or do you just call what do you do with ace king when you miss the flop are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at PokerCoaching.com slash RecPoker right now. There you go, folks. You heard the man. Go check him out. Um, so we talked about sort of like range and hand and how to, how to tell the difference between them and when we're going to play one and when we're going to play the other. I think you guys are really getting to the right point here, um, for our listeners about how you want to actually affect the range that your opponents play when you choose your sizing. If you choose a sizing that doesn't put them to a difficult decision, then you're not actually really narrowing the range. 
So the worst thing you could do here would be to raise to like three or four big blinds um, because you're not actually gonna narrow the ranges. All you're really doing is bloating the pot and uh, you're gonna be out of position the whole time. So I really like this idea of making it a real raise that puts people to a decision um, or the, the less optimal solution of, uh, of calling and leaving some EV out there by basically turning your hand into a set line spot. Now, is there anything about cash versus tournament mindset in particular that uh, informs how people thought about this? Or was there any other responses to the poll or, or on Discord, Eric, that, that made you think about it? Um, well, one thing is, right, in cash, you can just reload. So you, mm. you're trying to push every edge that you have to get as much EV. And in cash, the first chip you lose is as valuable as the last chip you lose, which isn't true in tournaments, right? The last chip you lose is worth way more than the first chip you lose or, or gain. So um, that's definitely, in tournaments, it's, you know, your, uh, your stack preservation is much more important than, than cash where you just reload. And if you have an edge, just reload mm -hmm. and, and try to push that edge again, or it's tournament, right? You're out. Yeah, I think that's, that's really, really important. And especially when you're thinking about deeper stack play, you know, those decisions, they're, they become more expensive, the more chips you've got behind. So, uh, but they're still only worth one chip each. So it's, it's a kind of interesting effect where people have to really think about sort of the, what is the risk of ruin in a tournament versus what is the risk of ruin in a cash game and um, how to calibrate down to that. Um, we could talk about this a little bit more, but I know Eric, speaking of cash play, uh, so a lot of our tournament, a lot of our members uh, prefer tournaments or they've play live tournaments or they've gotten used to playing tournaments online over the last couple of years. Um, but you and I uh, like playing cash and you've set up this play, explain and learn uh, event for premium members at Rec Poker that runs every week on Thursday night that takes more of a cash play uh, attitude to, to your learning styles. Talk a little bit about that and um, how that works and how people can join. Yeah, I did cash play just because it, it's um, it, it lend itself better because it's the same situation each week. We're we're deep stacked. We start with uh, it's it's targeted for six max, but sometimes we have a little less than six. We've had as much as seven, but uh, what we do is we play online, and I have a recording of the session where everybody's whole cards you can see on the recording, but we as participants can't see each other's uh, whole cards. Uh, what we do is um, uh, when the action's on you, you ex explain your action, you know, the reasons behind it. Again, the, the video. Oh, I just lost. Do you guys still have Eric's feet yeah, there? Yeah, I, I see him. I, I don't hear him. him. Oh no, <laughs> well, we may have temporarily lost uh, Binkley there. Um, oh, oh, that affects you arranging them. Oh, here we go. We now, lost you. Oh, now we got God. you back. Bad timing, <laughs> bad timing, Eric. Here, oh, here's, wow. here, here's where you were. Okay. Eric, Eric was saying that what <laughs> happens is uh, he's got the recording where you can see everyone's uh, whole cards. And the way it works is the players take, take turns as it's their turn, explaining their action. And you can't hear each other while you're playing, but when you watch the recording, uh, you can actually just watch people taking turns explaining their action hand by hand, street by street. And and then Eric, you make those videos available to members and, and you post follow-up discussions, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's available to, the group is available to premium members. And so uh, premium members can join the group and then join the session and then play in the session. And then afterwards uh, you can view the video and then we have a discord uh, server and uh, we'll discuss it. Hey, which, what were you thinking? You know, why uh, would you have, actually today we have 
had a discussion. Hey, if I bet bigger, would you have folded? <laughs> yeah. Uh, think things like that. Uh, so it's we, we can get you know into different aspects of of how and why you we play the hand, and it's it's really fun. Yeah, and getting the getting the feedback is really cool. Like it's a great way to get inside the mindset of recreational players like us. And, you know, some people that we think are better than us and some people that we think we've got a skill edge on. And it just helps to kind of think, to, to see what they're thinking in the moment, the factors that they're considering, maybe we can learn from that, or maybe we can learn to exploit that. Um, and doing it inside this sort of shared community of the premium membership means that, you know, it's just your friends that are getting this kind of insight uh and information so it's been great I, I really enjoyed my my when i participated in it and um i know uh i know it's i know it's it's just a great way to learn about how people think about poker and then being able to follow up with those people like you say when it's all on tape and you can say oh you know what would you have done if the sizing was different or if i had called instead of raising here mm -hmm. that kind of thing um you can really explore some branches of the decision tree that you wouldn't be able to explore on your own. So um, I'm glad that's been such a hit. It's uh, super fun and uh, keep it up, man. Every Thursday night, right? Yes. Exciting. All right. Well, any other thoughts here on this spot, folks? I guess I want to be uh, very thoughtful um, or thankful rather to um, I'm a Luigi and uh, uh, Binkley, of course, who posted the post himself. Chris Jones, Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, Website Amp, Kim, John, Eric, and Steve. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye.